Make me want to be like you. Your holiness I will pursue. I want the heart of Jesus. Show me the meaning of your grace. I want to give the world a taste of the love of Jesus. Make me salt, make me light, and let your holy fire ignite. Reveal your glory in my life. I am not ashamed to lift up your holy name. Make me soft, make me laugh. You make me want to be like you. Your holiness I will pursue. I want the heart of Jesus. Show me the meaning of your grace. I want to give the world a taste of the love of Jesus. Make me soft, make me light. Let your holy fire ignite. Reveal your glory in my life. I am not ashamed to lift up your holy name. Make me soft, make me light. So set me as a city. Set me as a city on a hill. A lamp on a stand. Hold me in your image, the work of your hand. Set me as a city on a hill, a lamp on a stand. Hold me in your image, the work of your hand. Make me soft, make me light, let your holy fire ignite. Reveal your glory in my life. I am not ashamed to lift up your holy name. Make me soft and make me light. All right, once more. Make me soft, make me light. Let your holy fire ignite. Reveal your glory in my life. I am not ashamed to lift up your holy name. Make me soft, make me All right, this is a new song this morning, so as you feel comfortable singing it, join in with us. You choose the humble and raise them high. You choose the weak and make them strong. You heal our broken. The same love that set the captives free The same love that opened eyes to see Is calling us all by name You are calling us all by name The same God that spread the heavens wide the same God that was crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. You take the faith one aside and speak the words. You are mine. You call. Come 
that second verse again. For we are his portion and he is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way.
kind of ran everything together. The paper was too expensive not to. There were no punctuation marks. There were no new paragraphs. You just sort of had to figure it out by the context in which it was written. And so Langdon and SDNs did the best they could to, to put things into a natural order. And sometimes they did great. They bathed themselves in prayer. And other times, maybe they didn't do as well. But they gave it their best. And one of the areas where I think, I think with no intention at all, they nonetheless maybe missed a little bit, is with the story of Jesus' baptism and his sojourn in the wilderness. We often read these two stories separately because there's a chapter break between them. The baptism ends the third chapter in, say, Matthew's Gospel, and the other one starts at the fourth chapter, the sojourn in the wilderness. And yet they were really, I think, originally intended to be read together, at least initially. Because there is a unifying connection between the two. And that connection is the relationship between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So let's consider the two of them together this morning. Now, I'm not going to share both stories in full, because the, the second one goes on a little ways. But I am going to read the bridge between the two of them. See for how the Holy Spirit shows up and what it does. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus answered him, Let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Do you see how the, the Spirit of God sort of takes hold of Jesus? I mean, for lack of a better word, it just sort of takes hold of him in the baptism and then it continues on right into the, into the wilderness and how it drives him into the wilderness. Take away those chapter distinctions and we realize that the wilderness experience is an extension of the baptism. Do we see that? Because when we do, it gives us a powerful message about how the church ought to see its relationship to the Holy Spirit. And by extension, I would say this. A restructured church really ought to see this as how it lives into the world. For Jesus' baptism was not the end point of his journey. Rather, it was the beginning. Similarly, for the church these days, we cannot see relationship with Jesus Christ as an end point in and of itself. Rather, it is the beginning of our spiritual journey. In too many churches these days, and among too many Christ followers, relationship with Jesus is seen as like being a finish line. You get there and you're done. I've got it made. It isn't intended to be that way. It shouldn't be that way, as long as the reign of Christ is unfinished. So how do we, as a church, <coughs> follow what Jesus is modeling in Scripture? Well, I think we've got to be like Jesus in this moment. First, we have to be open to the touch of the Holy Spirit on our lives. It's a two-step process. It really is. <clears throat> and then after connecting with the Holy Spirit, as Jesus did in the baptism, then we are called to be led by the Spirit into the world. And that's what the met wilderness is. It's a metaphor modeling the world. And so preparing for this morning, I said to myself, what would be a good metaphor I could use to describe this two-step process? One where we come into the presence of God and then go out into the world. 
And it was at that point, earlier this week, when one of you sent me an email with a quote from Pope Francis. It was on this very subject. And Pope Francis gave me a wonderful metaphor to use. Here's his quote. Instead of being just a church that welcomes and receives by keeping the doors open, let us try also to be a church that finds new roads that is able to step outside of itself and to go to those who do not attend Mass, to those who have quit or are indifferent. He's essentially saying the same thing within the bounds of his faith tradition that I am today. And he's got a great metaphor, doesn't he? Doors. Let's think about that for a moment. We all came in a set of doors this morning, didn't we? That's how we all got here. Similarly, in a little bit, we're all going to go back out through those doors. The question is, when we walk out those doors in a little bit of time, are we going to walk out alone? Or are we going to be led out by the Spirit of God? there is a huge difference between the two. Jesus moves into the river. He's there to be baptized. John's not sure it's his job, but Jesus says, trust me on this one. It's your job. So John is the one who pushes him gently under the water and pulls him back up. That's the physical act of baptism. But it's only when that's over that the real moment kicks in. A door opens, if you will. And when Jesus was baptized, going back to 316, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well Please. A door opens to heaven. And Jesus, along with all the others who are witnessing this moment, they're brought into God's presence. And it's a critically important thing that you and I have such experiences as well. Going through heaven's doors, connecting with God's presence, making the connection with God's Spirit that is going to energize us and sustain us for when we move back out into the wilderness. You know what this time together is supposed to do? This, this time of worship is supposed to do for us? That's what it's supposed to do. We come in these doors to get infused with the Spirit that will eventually lead us out this, these doors so we can be sustained for God's work. Now, I know a lot of you are like me. I've been dealing with this respiratory thing since Easter. It's viral, and they tell me it's six to eight weeks to run its course, and i got a few weeks to go. <coughs> but one of the things I've been using that helped me get through this virus is, uh, well, it's right over here. In addition to the water, it's Hall's Methylyptus Cough Drops. Triple soothing action. <laughs> I wish I knew what triple soothing action meant. I don't. <laughs> so I was popping one of these the other day. And as I did so, something caught my eye on the wrapper. And I saved that wrapper because I never knew this. I never noticed it. Paul writes little things on their cough drop wrappers. Did anybody ever notice this? <laughs> I'm amazed at it. There's a, a little quote here that says, a pep talk in every little drop. I guess they assume if the cough drop is doing no good, you know, they'll give you a little pep talk and it's a little passiveness, and that'll just be a better attitude. That so that's what it is. There's little can do kind of statements they give you. So I read one of the little phrases. The one that made me think was the words I'm going to share now. Elicit a few wows today. That's uh, number 10, if, uh, if you want to pull up that one then. Elicit a few wows. And I thought to myself, I'm really not a wow kind of guy. <laughs> that's, that's not my MO in life, 
together or in the singing together or in the preaching or in the hearing of scripture, there ought to be something in this experience that elicits some wows from us. When we gather to worship God, that's what should happen. Look again at worship, because that's what it was at the River Jordan. A door to the heavens opens. The voice of God is heard. The Spirit descends. Now that's a wow experience. Worship is about opening the door to God's presence. It's about sharing that wow experience. And trust me on this, we need wow experiences in our life. All of us do. Because without that wow to kind of fire us up and then give us something to sustain us, well, look what happens to Jesus after he has his wow experience. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Anyway, they follow right on each other. Jesus doesn't get to stay in that nice, comfortable worship moment. It's off. The heavens close, the door goes shut, and it's wilderness time with all the temptations it has to offer. And the same is true for us. Whether it's in our time of worship, on Sunday mornings or in our private worship times with family or loved ones, we don't stay there. Eventually the door shuts and we move back out into the world. And you know what? That's okay. It really is. It's okay. Because when we go through the door away from the connected time with God, we don't go alone. The Spirit leads us out. And in a restructured church, I believe our task is simply this, to create wow moments of worship so that you are led out into the wilderness to continue to work for the reign of Christ. We come here to get all charged up and the Spirit leads us out. Now wait a second, you say. Wait a second. You want us to go out from God's presence? I thought God was everywhere. Well, yes, God is everywhere. But right now in worship, the center of our lives, the thing we're all focusing on, I hope, is God. When we go back out those doors, the cell phones are going to start ringing. The task list at home is going to be there. For a lot of us, there's going to be Mother Day celebrations that we're going to be expecting to part, be a part of. And then we're going to go to work tomorrow, and that task is going to come on us. And then there's going to be family responsibilities for some of us. You get the idea. Once we leave here, God is no longer the center post. God is one of the many pieces tugging in our lives. We pray it is the central piece, but we honestly have to acknowledge that's not always so. We're out from that central experience. And let me say this as well about the wilderness. Don't, make, don't take that in a negative sense. There's a lot of good out there. It's not the job of the church to just condemn. Are there challenges to? Oh, yes. Wilderness simply means the place where God is in the center. So we move out from there, and in so doing, we run into what Jesus runs into. Temptations, risks for our exploit. Jesus runs right smack into the death. Similarly, we run into risks out there too. And look, I'm not going to sit here this morning and make a list of all the temptations we face. You and I, we know our temptations very well, though. We sure do. Nor am I going to say to you what is also commonly said and what, honestly, sometimes I fall prey to, that the temptations today are so much worse than they were long ago. I really don't believe that. 
Temptation is temptation. It's the same for every generation. It's the challenge for all of us. Rather than talk about some litany of temptations, I'd rather talk to you about how we deal with them. I think the trick is to be constantly conscious of the things that tempt us in this world. I think about what Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer. It's what brings it to my mind. He says these words, and let's face it, we all kind of scratch our heads when we recite it. He says, lead us not into temptation. He's talking to God. He says, God, don't lead us into temptation. At least that's what it initially sounds like. Now, do we really think Jesus is implying that God's encouraging sin? No. That's not what's going on. Nor is he implying that temptation is some sort of unusual experience in our life. It is a de facto experience of our life. <coughs> Rather, Jesus is reminding us that we are all prey to temptation and that we have to be continually conscious of that. That we have weaknesses. And if we're not aware of them, we fall prey to our adversary. We're not to have any sort of false assurance in this world, in other words, that we can handle all the temptations on our own. You know, that notion that, hey, I can be put to the test and I can handle it. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been headstrong like that, thinking you're more than equal to the challenges you face? I've been there, and when I'm there, guess what happens? That's when I fall prey to the temptation. Rather, be consciously aware of the risks you face. They're different for each of us, but be aware of them. So we run risks like Jesus did. And in addition to running risks, there's something good that happens as well. When we go out the doors into that metaphorical wilderness, we're going to the place where we can provide meaningful service for God. And that's the exciting part. The place where we serve God that has the highest impact is not within these walls. We've already been touched, all of us, and connected with God. The place where the impact really magnifies is out there where people are still waiting to make that connection. And yes, it entails some risks. But in each generation, that meaningful service is what we're called to do. It reminds me of the famous woman, Harriet Tubman. You remember hearing about her in history class? She's one of my true heroes in the American culture. She was a runaway slave who got to the North <laughs> through some help from some sympathetic people. And she was so thankful for the help, she didn't know what else she could do with her life except to turn around and risk her own life being a conductor for other slaves trying to escape along the famous Underground Railroad. Now this woman is illiterate. That means she couldn't read a map. She couldn't read street signs. Every time she went to bring people out of the South, she literally had to memorize the landscape so she wouldn't get lost. Furthermore, she had had an abusive childhood at the hand of her slave master, so her health was perpetually weak. Thirteen times she went back across the Mason-Dixon line to bring over 70 other slaves out to freedom. It included many of her family members. It included a whole host of children. And once she got the kids out, they became her own because though she never had biological children and never could have biological children, she could have children that were hers. Now that's somebody who took risks. And I think about Harriet Tubman in the light of this morning's scripture. Every time she crossed that Mason-Dixon line, she was going into the wilderness. There was no safe house for her to retreat into. There was no setting like this where she could kind of get recharged. That was a wilderness she was in. If she'd been captured, the best she could hope for 
is that she would have been put back into slavery. The most likely outcome is she would have been killed. Yet, in spite of all of that, she was willing to go into the wilderness again and again and again and again. And here's the reason why. Because she knew that's what the reign of Christ required in the time in which she lived. Take some time and think about what the reign of Christ requires of us in the time in which we live. And then ask yourself, as a Christ follower, are you ready to take the kind of risks a Harriet Tubman took? Are you willing to go through those doors in a few minutes into the wilderness world filled with its bad and its good to serve the reign of Christ in beautiful ways? I pray that we will.
take us by the hand until we're out there. Seeing the good that's going on and seeing how we can join in. Seeing the temptations and keeping them consciously before us so we avoid that risk. And then seeing the places out there that aren't so good and where we've got to dive into risk so that meaningful service for the reign of Christ happens today. Yeah, God, it's kind of nice in here. And it's not always nice out there. So lead us out. Because your reign doesn't just happen in here. You said it would happen everywhere. You said your kingdom would come. Your will would be done on earth. Not just in sanctuaries. So Lord, if we put too much energy in here and not enough out there, forgive us. If we made church too much about what we want and not enough about what you desire, forgive us that too. Take us out of this place in a few moments with a spirit that sustains us, with hearts of fire with that spirit, with hands and minds and words ready to serve fully and graciously. And keep us mindful, mindful of our community's needs. We pray for those battling sicknesses and infirmities, whether it's that respiratory thing that's going around, or it's someone battling cancer, or an old friend of the congregation who's dealing with delicate eye surgery. Keep us mindful of all of these things. Pray as well, O oh God, for all of the women here and all the women of this world. ago somebody said let's have a day to honor mothers and to celebrate that day but like everything else we do Lord it's in a context and keep us mindful of our context we honor and are grateful for the women who are in our midst who have been mothers or the ones who have served as mother figures the daughters of this world. But we know that there are so many places where right now tears are falling because someone feels lonely on this particular day. Make us honor of them as well, O oh God. And keep us mindful that we live in a world where there is a real difference between how we treat the women in our midst and how we treat the men in our midst. You know, right now, there are women who are living in fear in every society on this planet. We know there are daughters who right now are in danger of being mutilated. Whether physically or emotionally, scarred for life. We know that right now, oh God, there are places where women can show nothing more than their eyes or they're considered cast out in sins. And Lord, we know that we, the men of this world are the ones who create this society. And so, O oh God, I say on behalf of all my brothers and myself, call us into account and make us ones who will, in each Mother's Day, be sure to honor all women and that to do that each and every day by searching for equity and justice in each human relationship. 
many, God, that's one of the meaningful services you need in the world today. Certainly it is. So help us be about it. And then help us be ones who also serve in joy, knowing that the fulfillment of your reign is not ultimately in our hands, but that your justice will come your hour by your work and that we are just a part of the journey. Remind us when we read your book we can skip to the end and see that God wins in the end of all things. That the reign of justice and peace and love and mercy is going to be the final destination of every woman, man, son and daughter. So as we give service to joy in our hearts, knowing that the victory is already promised. A victory that we have looked for in our lives and that Jesus taught us to pray for in these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Let's go.